So the text that I want to um, present today is a treatise on the harem that was published um, in 1680 in the form of a pamphlet um, by the head rabbi of the Sephardi community of Amsterdam, uh, Yitzhak Abad de Fonseca. And um, the treatise, I think, is very interesting and pretty unusual in that it directly addresses um, the sort of underlying theoretical basis for some disputes that were taking place around the same time. Um, so not just the details of the nitty-gritty of the disputes, but the underlying um, uh, sort of ideological or intellectual perspective. Um, it deals with the conceptual conceptualization of communal governance um, and its regulations, the role of the rabbi with respect to the lay government, um, and also um, secondarily, which is something I'll get to in a second, the relationship to non-Jewish courts, following up on David's presentation. Um, the central aim of the treatise um, is to support the current practice in the community according to which the Ma'amad, which is the lay governing council, uh, has um, the authority to wield the harem with only secondary sort of approval by the rabbi that's employed by them. Um, and it seems that this is a pretty typical situation among the early modern, especially Sephardi communities. I'm not as familiar with the Ashkenazi situation. Um, uh, the Anthony community was typical in that it was run by this lay council which governed most of its affairs and that the rabbis served as um, either advisors or kind of employees, um, helpers. Um, in Amsterdam, the rabbis apparently lent their approval to the harem that the Mahmud wanted to impose. Um, and they also apparently had their own rabbinic court, their own Beit Din, but we don't really know very much about those Beit Din. Um, there's no real records of them. There's just references to them. So we don't know much about what they did besides this. Um, Boab was one of the salaried chachamim, or rabbis, in this community from the time that it unified into one central community in, in 1639 until he died in 1693. And originally, he was one of four who were appointed. So there were four rabbis who were actually named in the, in the founding document, in the Eskimo, the communal regulations of, of the community, um, as the salary rabbis, and their positions and their relatives, the money and their pay is also in those regulations. He was one of them. But um, by 1660, he was the only one who remained alive. So the other three had actually all passed away in the second half of the 1650s, and they were not replaced when they passed away. So that from 1660 until 1693, which is the period in which he wrote this, he was the sole um, official salary rabbi. And that's not to say that there weren't other rabbis in the community. There were other people who were... Um, teachers and who also served on Batei Dean with him, but they didn't have this same status of having been apport, appointed um, to this communal position. Um, and that's, uh, that's relevant to one of the complaints that he mentions in the text, so we might come back to that point. Um, also just say that because he was this um, sole chacham, he also played a sort of unique symbolic role in the latter part of the century. So he's, I mean, he was a, he was a presence in the community. He was usually referred to as the Chacham or our Chacham or our Lord Chacham um, in the text. And he's often credited with having inspired the push to build the new synagogue in the first half of the 1670s, right? He delivered this inspiring sermon and he pushed everyone to this great, this great feat. Um, and so when he weighed in on what the authority of the Mahamad and the rabbi was with respect to the harem, this really meant something. And I think it's a measure of the depth of the rift in the community and the intensity of the disputes that were taking place that he actually found it necessary to put his perspectives into print. Uh, it's a pretty dramatic move. Um, now, a little bit more context before we actually get to the text. Um, the rift that was taking place, he does not describe 
the particulars of what was happening. What he does is describe the claims against the Mamluk's authority that his opponents make in various places. But what we know from other sources, and this is not my research, this has already been exposed by other historians, is that in the 1670s, and especially in the years leading right up to this treatise, there were a number of cases of public scandal and dispute. Um, so, so one of them, um, and these are treated mainly in, in the work of Josef Kaplan and, da and Daniel Switchinski. Um, so one of them centered on a man named Yitzhak Enriquez Coutinho, uh, who uh, entered into a long argument with the Mahamad over their apportioning of seats in the synagogue. So, and this was actually in 1680 at the same time as this treatise. And so it might be the most likely culprit as uh, um, the disagreement that, that above is speaking directly to. Uh, Coutinho had served on the board of the committee of administrators charged with organizing the construction of the synagogue. And then after its construction, when the Mahmud decided who would sit where, he apparently felt snubbed. He didn't receive the seat that he had expected to. Um, and he, uh, he challenged their decision, and it was long and drawn out. And he ended up taking them to the Dutch court um, because he was put in harem. Um, and the Dutch court um, eventually supported the Mahmud's position, as they tended to do in all of these cases. Um, but Coutinho, one of the reasons why I raise him in particular is because um, Two reasons. One is that he, in one of his petitions to the Dutch magistrates, he says that what he would like to do is actually just pray at home. He would just like to remove himself from the community and pray in private. And he says, quote, with eight or nine people, as he had been used to doing, without them troubling him over it. Um, and so I, I think that in, in that quote, there might be a sense that he's trying to uh, avoid the number 10 as a magic number of a minion and assume that the Dutch authorities may, may, may think that praying with eight or nine people is just praying in private as opposed to creating a minion. Um, because one of the things that Abob, Abob first of all mentions um, people who claim they want to just pray privately at home and then he also dwells at length on people who want to create a separate congregation with their own harem with a minion. And so he seems to be in dialogue with Coutinho's claims here. Um, but Coutinho is not the only one who was making such claims. Oh, the other reason is that Coutinho not only made these claims about his particular desires, but he also broadened his sense of the problem into a general indictment of the Muhammad's authority. And here, um, in the page of additional text that was included in um, your packet that you got yesterday, it's not labeled at the top, but it says number one, Isaac Enriquez Coutinho in a letter to the Mama. Um, I just added these two things at the, at the last minute thinking that it would bring a little bit of helpful context. So um, Coutinho writes, there's no Gentile tribunal in Europe that would offer judgment on a matter in which one of the judges held an interest. In your counsel, as God-fearing men, you should behave the same way. My lords, I see you are blind, since you do not see that authority is not maintained by weapons, but rather by rectitude, uh, which is greater than all the weapons. And that's what brings um, authority and respect and brings unity. And um, so he's, this is, um, he's directly contradicting their sense of how to govern. He's not just talking about, you didn't give me the seat that I wanted. Um, another kind of rebellion or dispute around the same time centered on uh, one Dr. Yosef Abarbanel Barbosa. Um, and this is a case that Yosef Kaplan actually talked about at some length in his really important article on the social functions of the harem. Um, because Barbosa was first put in the harem when he declined to obey the prohibition against buying meat from the Ashkenazi butcher, um, which someone else has actually pointed out was, was in some sense, a refusal to acknowledge that the community, that the Sparty community had, <coughs> had uh, the right to bound him, right? Um, so when he was banned for that, he appealed to the Dutch authorities to force the Mama to revoke the harem. 
And the Dutch authorities actually did so, told the Mahmud that they had to revoke this harem. The Mahmud revoked it, but then they said, um, but then they stripped him of his communal membership. So they said, okay, you aren't in the harem, but you're no longer in the community. <laughs> You don't want to be bound by us, you're not bound by us, you're not part of our community. However, the Mahmud then faced a big problem because a number of other people wanted to leave the community on the same terms. And so a number of men went to notaries and signed basically oaths saying, we're no longer members of the community. <laughs> um, and so the Mahmud had, a, had, had the problem of trying to keep people within the bounds of their jurisdiction at that point. Um, so their response was to say, that those um, individuals were inherently members of the community and it was against the community's rules to abdicate membership <laughs> so that they would be put in harem. And so they made a declaration that all of those people who had tried to strip themselves of membership were now banned. And, and they emphasized that that meant something much more severe than just not being part of the community. That meant you know, no contact. It meant not partic partaking of any of the... Um, the benefits of the community, weddings, burials, other kinds of support, praying with other Jews, right? They would be completely cut off. So apparently, and this is again, this is, um, this is Kaplan's work and I'm just relating it because it's connected to this. Um, apparently, uh, Barboza himself repented and he returned to the community, but a number of the others did not. And so it looks like at the time that Abab composed this treatise on the harem, there were still a number of individuals at large who were banned, maybe claiming that they weren't part of the community, maybe disputing the nature of the harem. We don't really know what their claims were exactly. Um, <clears throat> and there are others also, uh, I won't go into the details, but there are a few other disputes that took place in the early to late 1670s, just before this. Um, all of them are interesting, I think. So these disputes have been unearthed from the sources by other historians, but they've generally been treated as the result of social or class tensions, right? So people who were either coming from or, or clan conflicts, right? Um, whereas I think if you look at them with a Bob's treatise in mind, then you can see that they all have this common thread of really disputing the Mahmud's authority or the authority of the harem and the way that they're interconnected. Okay, there's one last context that I want to bring for all of this, which is that at the same time, there was also a similar uh, scandal in Livorno, which is also fairly well known, in that um, in the, I think it was in 1677, I forgot to write down the date, but a few years before this, the Parnassim of Livorno had made a sort of a power grab and declared that um, all cases between Jews within the community that would be adjudicated within the community, they would be adjudicated according to um, lay and mercantile law. So they would be adjudicated by the Parnassim and not by the rabbis and the Beit Din according to Din Torah. Um, and, the, and this would be the case now, even in cases where one or both of the claimants both respected, requested Dean Torah. So even if people said, I want the rabbis to judge the case, even if both parties said, I want the rabbis, the lay leaders now said, no, they can't. Um, and Jakob Sasportas, who was a rabbi there, um, and who's well known for his anti sabbatean uh, crusading, um, was just outraged beyond outrage, and he felt that this was the final straw in the attacks on rabbinic authority, and uh, began a letter writing campaign. If I'm not mistaken, he was actually placed in harem by the Parnassim, but I, I need to check on that. Um, began a letter writing campaign and he wrote letters to the Mahmud of Amsterdam, to the rabbis of Amsterdam, um, general open letters to members of the community. Um, and in his, and these letters, uh, some of them have actually been published. Um, but also in his letters, it's clear that one of the things one of his moves is to impugn the essential underlying authority of the Mahmud. So he calls them illegitimate because of the way that they were appointed, um, in addition to um, 
saying that their their uh, their judgments are against rabbinic authority. So there's this context for all of these disputes leading up to Abov's treatise is really is really what I've been trying to describe. Um, now, as we start to look at the text, I want to um, there's two things that I want to try to point out in it or argue about it, um, and I'm definitely interested to hear everyone's comments on on them. Um, the first is that the dispute over the harem that he talks about is as much about the political organization of the community as it is about the harem in particular. Um, so the entire discussion is wrapped around this assumption that the harem kind of represents the underlying political authority of the community. So there's this idea that if a group of Jews can create a harem, they can impose their will on anyone that the harem applies to. And, um, and that's a kind of rule. So the sense of the harem that he's using is less a punishment that can be imposed, like a ban, like now you're not allowed to talk to us, but rather this kind of authorization to create rules. Um, and it's a little bit hard to pin down exactly how to describe that. So again, I invite comments. Um, and then the other thing that I want to try to point out um, is, is a little bit more meta, um, is that if we think of this uh, as a political discussion on some level, then it bears a similarity to some political discussions going on among contemporary Christians. So Abob argues, among other things, well, he presents his opponents as arguing that if the harem was created, if the, if the underlying authority to impose a harem, harem comes from a group of Jews, then any group of Jews can now collectively form a harem, form their own congregation, and be separate from the main congregation at will. And his response is that the people of the community transferred their authority over to the Mahamad irrevocably. So the Mahamad got this authority, and now even if they break the communal regulations, and even if they govern badly, they cannot be overturned, and no one in the community can, um, can secede or start their, start their own community. So this obviously has a sort of uncanny similarity to Thomas Hobbes and John Locke um, and ideas about the social contract and the rights of um, subjects to oppose rulers, right? So I don't know how far we can take that. Um, I think it's there, but it's not explicit. So, so again, I, I'm interested to hear what people think about that. Um, to me, it's I, I can't I can't really read it without that ringing in my mind. So, um, all right, let's start to look at the text a little bit. And there's things that I that I'll start by pointing out, but then I I would hope that people will will jump in. Uh, so beginning on page, and I'm sorry, I have marked up a copy that's different pages from the book, so I'll go by the pages that are within the text, um, which are in bold with, uh, in, square in square brackets. So I'm looking at, actually maybe I can just find it in the book, I'm looking at page 62 in square brackets, it's right around the transition from page 3 to page 4. He starts out by declaring that his intention in the treatise is to show that no power can annul or invalidate the harem that the holy kahal took upon itself when everyone signed in the presence of the four chachamim. Um, and so, and then he goes on a couple of lines later to say um, that lifting it would be possible, but to do so would be to go against the unity and conservation of the kahal and feeding of the poor. And so the wording here really already points out that he's talking about the organization of the community um, in an underlying way and not just about a harem that's been imposed on one person, right? So this expression, the unity and conservation of the kahal and feeding of the poor was a relatively typical way of describing, it was sort of shorthand for the purpose of the community overall. It's used over and over, and over in, this, in the um, record book. Uh, and then he's also referring to the harem 
that was taken upon, that the Holy Kahal took upon itself, right, when everyone signed in the presence of the four hachamim. And what he's referring to there is the askamot that were signed in 1638 with the unification of the community. So in that case, um, when the three separate communities were coming together to form one community, they drew up a set of regulations, established the Ma'amad as the central authority with the sole right to impose the harem. And all of the, I assume householding, I don't actually know the rules for who signed, but um, all of the members of the community from the three congregations signed. And you can see in the record book, there's pages and pages of, of signatures on this, right? So that's what he's referring to. Um, and in the additional texts, I brought, so there's two versions of the Askimo, one in 1638 and then a kind of follow-up in 1639 that revises and expands them. And I brought articles from each of those that describe um, the Mahmad's sole authority being granted and the, the way that the harem is intertwined with the Mahmad and the kind of the sense of unity. Um, already in those texts. So a Bob sense that the, that the harem is connected to the community's um, unified governance is not unique to him. It's, it's already here. Um, the other thing uh, just here in this passage that I would say is that there's in the, in the intervening sentence that I didn't read out loud, there's no way to lift the ban on a violator of, of this harem, aside from the call itself absolving him, which requires at least as many people, etc. And it ought not to be done. So there's this, there's a, there's a sense that the lifting the ban is kind of invalidating the underlying harem, right? He's building up, lifting the ban into something bigger than just imposing or revoking a simple punishment, I think. But again, I, I, I would like to hear about whether, um, how typical this language is and whether you would find it in other places. Um, then what I think, uh, so I'll just point out a number of the claims that he describes his opponents as making. So on page, on his page nine, which is in the book in page, on page 64, he says, it's the beginning of a paragraph, this harem is what they claim to be invalid, except in the company of 10, which they call a congregation. They say that being fewer, the deputies have no authority to impose a harem, but only to swear each one for himself. Um, so the opponents are claiming that the Ma'amad is just any other group of ten Jews who can make an oath for themselves, but they can't impose their will on other people in the community inherently. Um, and he makes a response to this. Then the second um, claim that his opponents apparently make is that the harem doesn't apply to future generations or um, as we'll see again below, the harem doesn't apply to those who weren't present to sign it, right? So then he has to argue that in fact the original um, signing was then valid on those who might come later as members of the community and, and um, their, their descendants. Uh, the third claim of the opposition that he points out is on his page 13. So this is um, on the top of 65. Um, he says, this then is the crime. Some who do not fear God and presume to know more than they do argue that when 10 individuals separate themselves from the holy congregation, they free themselves from the harem by forming their own congregation. But he says, but if this is true, then the harem would have no value at all. Um, yeah. uh, then in the fourth claim that he, that he points out that the opposition makes um, is that the harem of the community has no value or of the ma'amad has no value because it was not made with the authority of a chacham so here he's taking up the issue of the role of the rabbi with respect to the, the ma'amad's imposition of the harem and he says First of all, he says it's not true because the original 
theorem that was created in the founding document um, was, was made with the approval of the four Chachamim. Um, but then he also goes on to a more theoretical argument about why this isn't right um, and says that it can't be the case that a Chacham is required and because then a Chacham would have unchecked authority. He says on his page 14, um, so this is the middle of 65, if this argument were true, it would mean that the Kahal does not have enough authority to create a, a Kharam on his own, which would invest the Chacham with unchecked authority. Right, so he's emphasizing that the kahal has this power to impose a harem, not the rabbi, not a rabbi just, just because he's a rabbi. Um, and what he is then going to do is argue that the kahal and the ma'amad are now one and the same. Um, and he does this on page, his page 15. Um, he says, they use this to try to remove authority from the ma'amad, but it is the same as the kahal and cannot be made or unmade according to the needs of the time. Um, finally, then, we come back that the, there's this claim at the bottom of his page 16. So we're talking about the top of our 66. Um, he says, Let's move on to a breakdown. Another absurdity. Um, they say that they were not present for, did not sign, did not approve this harem. And so it seems to them that it does not obligate them. Right? So they're claiming they didn't sign off. They don't have to obey it. Um, and uh, there's an argument about whether it looks like the, the opposition is, it looks like they've gone back and forth a little bit about the idea of, of the Torah having been given in, at one time, but still applying to future generations. And they make a counterclaim, and he says, oh, you don't really understand what you're talking about. You're, you're saying things you don't believe, and you don't really understand what you're saying anyway, and here's how we have to understand it. Um, all right, and then the, the one last thing that I want to I wanna just draw your attention to is that then there's a, a large section of the rest of the text where he addresses the question of the Adam Chashuv, right? of the um, respected man who is um, um, understood to be needed to approve the regulations of townspeople. And so also in my additional texts, this extra sheet on the back side, I've brought the Talmudic passage that mentions the Adam Chashuv. Um, um, basically making the conclusion that um, where that, that uh, an important person of an Adam Hashuv, an important person, right, is required to validate um, communal law. Now there's a lot of rabbinic commentary on this passage. It's used over and over again. And almost all the time it's interpreted to mean that the Adam Hashuv is a rabbi and that a rabbi's approval is needed for lay governance, right? So that a lay council would need to have the harem approved by the rabbi, by the Adam Chashuv. A Boab goes against the grain of that interpretation of this passage by saying that the Adam Chashuv does not have to be a rabbi. It, um, I think I'm going too long, so I'll not point out the place in particular, but um, does not have to be a sage, does not have to be a chacham, but rather only needs to be an elected official. And so he says, if there's a chacham who's elected as the chacham, who's an appointed chacham, like me, then, um, then his approval is required, but only because of his office as this elected official and not because of his nature as a rabbi. Um, and so it's a, it's a relatively dramatic claim for him as the rabbi to be making. Okay, so I'm going to stop there and let and take comments and questions. So you mentioned the uh, argument that uh, people had ceded their authority to the ruling council and were their uh, Christian um, 
political uh, antecedents for that argument. Just one I wanted to mention, it's an idea in the, in the civil law that uh, uh, the people at some original moment had ceded authority to the emperor, and then from that original act, power flowed. And this can be interpreted both in an absolute and a conditional way. The absolute way is reading is once ceded, that's it. <laughs> now the people have no more role to play. Uh, the conditional world, the conditional way it's understood could be, and there's a variety of these, but it could be, um, the people seed with conditions, and if rulers violate the conditions of the original act, the rulers could be removed, or alternatively, the people do not have to obey. The conditionality could be time limited. So there's all sorts of ways this could go, but they could be drawing on this mode of thought in this document. I want to follow up on this with a methodological question, because when you think about let's say, trying to draw comparisons to Hobbes and Locke and so on, how much of Hobbes and Locke might you also want to put, since they're you know, now the great attempt to achieve their Hebraic thought, right, their own political Hebraic thought? I mean, you get a kind of recursion, which is, right, is this a reaction to external thought, or is this actually a kind of flow of ideas that's much, much more complicated? Especially because almost everything that's in here, so far as I can tell, is, I mean, it's taking, it's sort of ratcheting up a medieval discussion that's been going on for 300 years of the, you know, the individual versus the community and the, de the development of nascent democratic thought in the 12th, 13th, 14th century in the medieval Jewish writers is very clear. So um, sort of methodologically, I wonder how you parse out this incredible flow of ideas. I can't think of one argument uh, maybe. I'm, I'm not sure, but it would be very interesting to parse out if there is an argument here that is not already in the sources. Now, it's clear that there may be external conditions that are causing them to go one way or to ratchet it up. Mm -hmm. but. No, I agree. I mean, I think that's... Um, it clearly there's a relation to those debates going on in contemporary Christian political thought. But contemporary Christian political thinkers were also drawing on... on Jewish thought and, and biblical Hebraism, right, in order to make their arguments. And so, yes, it's an unbelievably complex um, genealogy of these ideas. And I don't, I mean, I think the point is well taken that it's not necessary to say that he's drawing on those external ideas to make these arguments. On the other hand, based on um, the, the broader s study that I've done of sources from the same time, these guys are constantly drawing from broader kind of political perspectives. I mean, they talk all the time about um, reason of state, and they talk about Machiavelli, and they, they're, they're, um, you know, they're quoting and paraphrasing um, 16th century Spanish political thinkers, and so it's real. And Hobbes was in Abob's library, so there's there's reason to believe that. It's, it's at the very least, it's not purely coming from within a rabbinic tradition, right? At the very least, there's awareness that these are the same ideas going around in the Christian community. Can I just point out that the actually uses the term reason of state? Yes, I know. Yeah. <laughs> I think he uses it twice in this text, actually, once positively and once neg negatively. So once he calls it a curse to reason of state, and the other time he says something like that they're doing it because of, you know, for a good reason, reason of state. Yeah, just about your mention that there was an issue with the minyan and the legality of that vis-a-vis -vis the state. I mean, that's something that has a wide, is a widespread issue. It's in Germany in, into the 18th century, for example, the Duke in court you of Braunschweig, Alexander David, has to petition the Duke and explain that he on certain holidays has a minyan in his home and it's a wonderful document because it describes what the what the uh, in-house synagogue looked like um, and he says that he brings in foreign Jews who have come for the fairs and, and uses them to help make his minyan. Concerning Anne's last, uh, last matter, uh, in the Ottoman East, already in the 16th century, there is a symbiosis between the, the leadership of the Kahal and the Kahal, the, the rabbi of the Kahal. They cannot do without him. They need him for his uh, uh, authority. He, he uh, gives them the, the authority to, to pronounce a cherem 
and but at the same time they would not allow him uh, to to uh, ban anyone without their permission so they need him he needs them uh, uh, each they work together yeah i think the same thing is true here i mean uh, um, and actually it's the same um, David described the formula in the records of when they impose a chayram, it's the ma'amad imposing the chayram with the approval of the chacham. And that's exactly what you find in, these, in the record book here. Um, it just, it's that same formula every time. Um, and from all appearances, it's, it looks like it's the ma'amad's decision. I mean, it's the ma'amad's record book. It's their, um, their deliberations, but the chacham is there to lend his or his office to it, according to this argument. I think what, what to me, what makes this treatise interesting is that it's actually trying to delve into what that relationship is about. Like, why, who is the chacham with respect to the kahal? Where does his authority come from? And where does the Mahmoud's authority come from? But the Western Spaladin go back to Italy, and Italy goes back to the Ottoman Empire. Two, two things. First of all, this is a very, just a curious question. Those, those people who separated themselves, who took themselves out of the community, um, where did they go? Did they associate themselves with the Ashkenazi Jews? Did they, did they, just, did they live as Christians? Did they live kind of another world? Of, you know, yeah, um, you know about that's a great question. Um, again, you know, that's this is not my research. This is I'm all taking from somebody else there. So, um, but I seem to recall. Uh, maybe I shouldn't even try to say something about this, but but I seem to recall Joseph Kaplan having said that. Uh, a number of them just kind of disappear into the ether. <laughs> they don't appear in any records after that, right? Mm. Kind of, I mean, like Spinoza, right? He, he's famous for being so-called first Jew to not exist within, to mm. leave the Jewish community and not convert to Christianity. Mm. But that's clearly not the case. There were plenty of others who were doing oh, it. Okay. Um, so that, <coughs> then there's there are some clues that some might be trying to go, if not to become members of the Ashkenazi community, then at least to use services of the Ashkenazi community so that they can in some way still practice elements of Judaism without having to submit mm -hmm. to the sort of iron hand of the Mahamad. Um, but there are just hints of that. I don't really have any evidence of it. In my, my, in my suggestion, um, instead of going, like Suzanne was saying, towards a more kind of uh, democratic, um, versioning democ democratic consciousness, Perhaps the putting so much authority on the on the, on the Muhammad is really is really a more retrograde thing from our point of view, which is really a more the, the Spanish Portuguese Jews had and continue to have a real sense of nobility and the importance of the Adam Chashuv in a in a non religious sense, but in the sense of a socioeconomic sense, um, and that putting so much authority on the secular on the secular group. Um, was really part of that, that construction of self and, and uh, well, sure, know, and we, yeah, I mean, yeah, and see. so if you, yeah, if we read this in political terms, then then the the Chacham Mahmad alliance here is very anti-democratic. I mean, there are people in the community who are trying to claim that they want to have their own rights as subjects, mm -hmm. right? But they're clamping down on it and saying no, right. <laughs> that mm -hmm. that they alone have this power, and it's it is absolute rather than conditional, right? How were they? They were elected. No, um, they weren't. They were self-perpetuating. So the Mahmud itself <laughs> chose its, chose its the successor. Yeah. Uh, I like to put this in a little broader perspective. Um, this is a problem that would not have happened in the medieval period because Khairaishu would make sure would, 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 would make sure that the, the, the Mahmud had the authority because you couldn't live there if. They didn't allow you to live there. So what's happening here is uh, what we see throughout the, you know, the early modern modern period is the breakdown of uh, of the discipline of Kehillah, uh to the point where, when with the rise of national states, you know, you, you the Kehillah basically broke down, and you needed some kind of charismatic Hasidic leadership to take place. So in other words, I, I'm I'm very happy to hear that uh, the Rehab Wolf had uh, Baal Hobbs in his library. But I don't know that he, you know, in other words, it, the problem was much more basic. And, and, you know, maybe he got, got some, you know, got some ammunition, Hobbs and so on, but he, he had to deal with how do, we, how do you reconstitute the authority of the community when you don't have Chemer Yishev anymore? 
And so, you know, Adam Chashuv might be something. In other words, you've got, you've got to re, re, reorder all the priorities. And as I said, eventually, it did, even that didn't work. And you, had, you ended up with, you know, with Hasid, uh, Hasidic weapons. I, I, I just want to jump in here. I think in the Sephardic community in the early modern period, you have a large group of people who are living on the margins of the community. There are many people, not just those who have been placed into Kherim, but who have never quite joined the community. Um, they are conversos who want to kind of live between worlds, who want to be able to travel back to Spain and Portugal, or to do, uh, some of them don't want to be circumcised, some of them, they have all kinds of motives. Um, and they live on the borders of the Jewish community. Some of them send their children to Jewish schools and have their newborns circumcised, but are not themselves formal members of the community. Yaakov Sarsportas has a beautiful uh, a response um, dealing with that type of person. He, um, he says, do their children get called to the Torah? Uh, can we call an Avraham ben Terach? Uh, he calls it, you know, uh, to, to the Torah, and how do we do so? If the father is living as a non-Jew and the child is living as a Jew. So this is, um, when we talk about people reconstituting the Kahila foreign part, we're talking about something that has not been a traditional community continuously, and is now coming to the point where it's breaking apart. Rather, yeah, that, that we're talking true, about um, a kind of peripheral existence and whether it can ever be rebuilt in that ideal medieval way. Yeah, yeah that, that's, that's exactly what I mean. In other words, they no longer have the authority that they had before. Let me it's just really complete Eli Sheva one, one point about Yosef Kaplan because I know what he's been doing this year. And he's been researching not only Jews, but non-Jews in Holland who belong to the community of Nishtahin Nishtaher, which means that they, they simply aren't identifying with anything. They're, they're, they're completely on their own, and uh, they seem to be doing quite well. So there is that, that extra element in it, and Kaplan is going to be, be producing a really important book on this in the short, the short future. Yeah, well, actually, this ties in with things that have been mentioned, I, but I, I do think another part of the context is that the, the, uh, there's freedom to do this because there's no compulsion from the authorities to belong to any community. It's certainly true that there are these types in the Christian world who belong to no community, but there are also those who are hangers on at the edges of yeah, a, yeah, yeah. the Calvinist, for example, Amsterdam is the majority of the population, the Christian population of Amsterdam is Calvinists, but most of them are not members, actual members of the Calvinist church. So these fights are certainly going on outside the, uh, the Jewish community. And I also would like to point out that Daniel Levy de Barrios in 1863 wrote his triumphal the Gobierno Popular, which is, uh, I think, makes very, very clear that at least the literati in the community are thinking about um, the analogs between uh, what's going on in Dutch society politically and what's going on with them. They're thinking of the community, of the community as a republic, and how should it be organized? Should it be democratic? Should it be aristocratic? Should it be republican? Should it be uh, uh, ruled by one person? And um, so these questions are laid out by him in a very um, explicit way. There's nothing nearly so explicit here, but I have no doubt that it, not necessarily Locke, <laughs> but Peter de la Corte, you know, and the figures in in uh, in in the Dutch Republic who are uh, trying to answer questions that have become vital for everyone. Yeah. Um, I'm familiar with the, the work that you've done on, on the article that you have on that. And, and, and also the, dis the dissertation that I've just finished deals with a number of other texts where members of this community are writing very explicitly about their community as a political entity, um, talking about 
the competition between religion and politics in the community and how to mediate those things and calling the mama governors and talking about what is the ideal form of governance and um, definitely applying that to themselves. So certainly they had in mind in general that this was um, a republic in the kind of broad sense of meaning a, a political entity, a commonwealth. We talk about his uh, other sources, Locke and Hobbes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. His reasoning is remarkably wide-ranging in terms of his sources. We talk about that, like uh, what we saw earlier today. He quotes biblical examples um, on his own. Seems like on his own authority, uh, his own reading of biblical narratives. As far as I can tell, I don't think there's anybody you know who were going to ask who are his sources for this. Um, which is a strange way to make a rabbinic argument. Uh, I think Spalding's is another right. one to raise as well. I, I think that actually it's interesting. I see a divide in line with the text. Yeah, I was going to say, the beginning leads you out. So he opens up with a lot of good biblical examples that might be the first. He's, he's thinking probably the popular reader knows the Bible, maybe. And you can quote Jonathan, Saul, etc., etc. And then suddenly, you know, that takes Holtz has to go burying, looking for it. You know, the Chacham has to go looking for the Rajba, the Rishba. Mm -hmm. yeah, there's there's, 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 there's right. one blatant late, late quotation. The first one was Pinterest. Okay. You can point that out to me. There's also there's a whole more in large Section 10. Section 10. Section 10. Section 10. No, the biblical verses, the biblical biblical argument, when you get to questions about the king and equality, it was an interview, right? It's the whole of the public and Samuel, the elders going to Samuel. And they stay as biblical text, because as you mentioned before, as a, part, as a reader would read this, this I think. This is That's how I understand it. Right. Start out like, exactly. Yeah. Start it's very convincing. And then he gets to this point, at least in, our, in the book up here, on page 66, he says, in some, and then with da, 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 da. And then we enter a whole rabbinic discussion. Mm -hmm. I think there's a rather, I don't know, sharp, but there's a division. That first section seems to me, I agree with you. Mm -hmm. You know, we get these biblical texts, when the kingship, other issues they want to bring in, and they may have gemaras that back them up, Talmudic sources, but he doesn't quote the Talmudic sources, he quotes the reader. But reader can read the Bible and say, well, everybody knows about Joshua, Joshua's here. These people are here. But then we get to the end and he goes back. So we have this mixing of two. I don't think you would have found a problem that existed in the 12th century. This is not the way the 12th century rabbis would have dealt with this. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. a much different sort of audience. Right. 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 Just the language. Yeah. I mean, the very fact that you're quoting, whoever saw the Rishpah the Rashbah, what reported in Portuguese? Mm -hmm. That in itself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but you have, but the point is that it's, uh, but, um, and this is me talking about the period, it's just an interesting, um, fantastic mix. Uh, I'm just wondering the question of who is going to be. Uh, I mean, that's my, that's my, yeah. that's I mean, my. The members of his community who were doing exactly the same thing. Um, as for the biblical, the treatment of the biblical um, stories, I, it, this is also could be seen as kind of characteristic of Abu Ab himself because his other major work, um, which is also really understudied, not studied at all, just like this, um, is a is a paraphrase of the Pentateuch that he composed um, not long, oh, he was working on it at this time, clearly, because it was published, I think, in the early 1680s. So, and that is a, I mean, someone really needs to work on, on that work, because it, it's, um, it makes no references to any rabbinic sources explicitly at all, but clearly brings in tons of context for every biblical story, and it does not quote, I mean, it's not direct translation of the Bible, it's telling uh, it doesn't start in the beginning. It starts with, you know, uh, com I, if I can, now it's been a long time since I looked at it, but it starts with an with a abstract discussion of the oneness of God, right? Um, so he's bringing in all of this other material and incorporating it into this kind of popular paraphrase of the Bible, um, which, you know, he's doing here too. Wasn't it, was it also thought that was really important in this uh, sort of uh, congregation? Uh, just because of the resi residual effects of the universal past, the Bible had much more clear. Yeah, it's possible. Yeah, it's possible that some of the, the former conversos would tend to privilege biblical texts over rabbinic texts, uh, and so he could be appealing to them. I'm sure. Okay. I was going to say that there's a really there's a parallel discussion going on between Chachamim, uh, Mama, and the Caribbean at the same time, and um, they for things that. Uh, people would have been banned from the community in the Caribbean at the same period. They're actually not allowing them to be banned from the community because 
the Ma'amad has to be a strong political entity um, and has to have a strong community behind it just because of numbers. So an interesting thing to look at is, is what the strength of the situation of the community is within the larger environment. Um, during the same period, uh, because in the, the Caribbean it just allowed for Portuguese Jews to live on the margin of society if they so, of their own community if they so chose, um, the, both the community and the community leadership had to have a symbiotic relationship which said that we will not allow people to retreat from the community because if they do retreat from the community, then in the face of local governing bodies, we have no strength. Mm -hmm. um, so it would be interesting to look at when, when harm is imposed and when, um, when people are allowed to retreat more easily. Sure. And then there's always, a, um, there's always a question of what's going on in reality as opposed to what they're asserting, right? Because in Amsterdam, too, their assertions would be that you're not allowed to remove yourself from the community, and yet people did. So, but that's, I mean, I'd be interested to hear more about what's going on in the Caribbean. It's a good context. Yeah, a couple of uh, very quick points. Uh, first of all, um, uh, I think there is a little bit of a danger if we um, uh, use the state and political rhetoric as the equivalent model for what's going on in the Jewish community. Not because it isn't there, but because there's an alternate model as well, which is the power of commercial companies. In other words, I think that if you really want to think about the Jewish law created by Spartan, especially in, uh, in the West, in Western Europe, the model is not really the state, it's the commercial company which has, uh, and commercial colonies, which have a structure and which have power and which have leading lay uh, governors who have the right to make decisions and to exclude people or let people in. So that, that's one. Hmm? Corporation, it's exactly. It's Corporation itself, which is yeah. a model of power for the state. Oh, oh, okay, but, but the point is, what is the legal rhetoric that they're, they're quoting? That, that's one thing. The second thing that's fascinating to me is, and um, you know, um, to pick up on, on Yaakov Elman's point before, the Kharma Yishuv was not universally accepted, certainly not among Spartan. It was certainly not known in Italy, so Yaron's comment that it goes from here to here to here, it's not, it's not, not so simple. And we're not looking, again, I, I make the point that the Kila is not uh, falling apart, the Kila is being created and negotiated. And in that context, what's very interesting is here we have a 16, what was it, 1680s or, 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 or discussion. In the 1530s, exactly the same kind of discussion is being debated in Bologna by a Spartic rabbi who makes no Spartic sources, uh, who cites no Spartic sources. He, and it's obviously a totally different time, totally different context, but he uses Ashkenazic sources to legitimize the notion, and there too there is no there is no such exclusivist thing. He's trying to make the argument about the right of the community to make a ban and then whether or not other people can impose it. These are major issues that are being debated and so it would be very interesting to compare this, not just in terms of, gee, he uses biblical sources, which, in, which indeed is interesting, but also he doesn't use a whole bunch of other sources that already exist. He specifically uses Spartan sources. Yaakov Katz once made the, the point in passing that um, Ashkenazim at this time used Spartic models of Kila because they didn't have the experience of big communities and so they have to use medieval Spartic halacha uh, and in fact people have debated this but, but here you have an example of a guy specifically using Spartic uh, sources uh, for his uh, rhetoric about uh, Kila and so forth and the last point that I just make is that that uh, you've got to be very careful here about this business about the rabbinate and the challenge to the authority of the rabbinate because the rabbinate as an official appointed institution and as having power is itself the creation of the early modern period, at least in, in, in the West and uh, in, in, in many things. And the business about the Adam Chashuv, the reason the Adam Chashuv was a rabbi in, in medieval times is because only rich people could become rabbis, so it was Hainu I mean, it was one kind of thing, usually, or in many cases. The Rajbah wasn't the Rajbah just because he was learned. It was because he's learned rich. Uh, and so was, uh, uh, what's his name in Prague? The uh, Festival Landau in Prague. I mean, he was rich. Uh, he was 18, uh, so. uh, Yeah, I know, but I'm saying, over a very broad thing, so this business about the rabbinate and Adam Hashub and what is lay and what it's more complicated than simply. Um. Okay, can I just respond very quickly to that? Um, okay, on each of your points, uh, as first of all, on it, on commercial colonies being the model, I think that that's a, that point is very well taken, and I, I think it's true that in many ways they 
they may have actually been modeled more on commercial um, colonies or, or corporations. But at least at this point of time, at, the, at, at this point, they're not using that kind of rhetoric to describe themselves. They're very much using political rhetoric. And so whether it's because something has shifted from when the communities were first established and now they're thinking about it differently or for some other reason, all of this politics is coming up right in these couple of decades. Um, the second thing, the Kharam Hayishuv is, to me, this is a big question. I mean, how this relates to the Kharam Hayishuv. Not because, I mean, because I realize that they didn't have it, nor was it a Sephardi tradition, but there's something about the way that the harem is being conceived here that has a kind of a similarity to it, right? The harem is being conceived as something that's all-inclusive of every member of the Spanish and Portuguese nation who arrives in Amsterdam automatically. Um, it's, not, it's not purely a conception that the harem is something that the lay council can impose on whoever they want. There's also this, there's, it's slippery, and I don't really know how to get at it, but there is a broader sense of the harem, I think, that has some kind of relationship to the... I don't know. So it raises the question of the Haram Ayyushuv, um, obviously, because many people have brought this up. Um, and then the last thing you said, I think that's absolutely right. I wouldn't think about this in terms of the decline of the rabbinate over a long period of time. I mean, I think something else is going on here. It's, there are new assertions of power and new power dynamics and um, attempts to, to create a strong rabbinate and create a strong lay council rather than to shore up something because it hasn't existed before.